Hello there, and welcome back to the Senate Podcast. We're on episode number 11. It's funny, I just typed it out on here, and then it disappeared, so I'm glad I remembered that. And this is what, the uh, second or third one with you back, Tony? How you doing? Doing pretty good, you know, uh, not to be all sentimental, because this ain't a freaking <laughs> soap opera, but... 2022 was a pretty terrible year, but uh, I'm trying to get my head on straight. Uh, I've been helping myself in many ways, and so far, 2023, not too bad, not too bad. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I mean, what, I, what I've been doing is I've been listening to a lot of David Goggins, if you know who that mm-hmm. is. If you don't, look him up. I, I can't describe him to you. You just... You watch one video and your mind is going to be changed. I actually, uh, I bought his book. Well, I used, um, I use an audible, uh, credit or token or whatever for his second book and I'm on chapter four. So super, super interesting, but it's a new year. Um, do you have any plans for, uh, gaming this year or, or looking forward to any movies coming out this year? It's going to be a a big year. Yeah. Um, my, I've had a, rough relationship with video games over the past year or so uh in 2020 it was this year of like just playing a ton of games and you know we were all quarantined which i didn't really have much of a social life anyway but i worked on myself a lot and then after that i don't know stuff kind of started to dry up i fell into a bit of a funk uh I didn't beat too many games, uh, so I think this year I'm going to really focus on just playing the kind of games that I like and like not worrying about feeling like a quote-unquote fake gamer. You know, uh, as far as specifics, uh, I want to play the Danganronpa series. I yes. played a little bit of one a year or two ago, and then I saw like a spoiler, and then I stopped, but I've forgotten a lot of stuff that happens. Uh, just uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically these high school students who are attending this like elite high school for like really talented people. It's like you attend this school and you're set for life. You know, uh, they arrive on their first day and then basically find out that they're stuck there indefinitely and the only way for anybody to leave is to murder somebody else and not get caught so it's a visual novel investigation kind of thing there's uh there are these sections where it's like a trial where like you think somebody committed a murder and you're like putting them on trial and like you you have to like gather evidence make arguments like an emergency meeting among us it's it, dude. I when I played it the first time, playing the first trial was the most anxiety I've ever had in a game. Like it was, it's intense. Uh, I actually started playing the first one. I played only uh, a few minutes of it because that's one series I've been wanting to get into. So yeah, dude. Spike Chunsoft. I played a uh, World's End Club. I beat it earlier this year. Uh, it's more kind of like it's. It starts out as that kind of premise and then it evolves into what i would call the goonies meets metal gear solid that's so interesting sounds weird uh it's just a just a crazy like uh utaru uchikoshi who writes some of these games a a mad lad he's a mad lad other than that i want to play one game we'll be talking about metroid prime remake i mean remaster Oh yeah, basically just playing, just uh, really tapping into my inner pretentious snob and playing a lot of artsy indie games. And then once in a while, I'll play a popular thing. Once in a while, you'll dip into the AAA space. Yeah. Uh, So 2023, we actually have have had a few AAA games come out this year. And uh, Metroid Prime remake for Switch. We're just going to call it the remake, Metroid Prime remake. Oh, yeah. um, I'm actually holding it here. I got the physical. Haven't jumped into it yet because I'm almost finished with Sonic Frontiers, and then I'm going to jump into Metroid Prime. But man, one of the best drops I've dude, ever seen for a game, dude. Like what available are, later today, and people are like, yeah. "What?" They um they did that with Hi-Fi Rush over on Xbox Game Pass, and then they ghost dropped or shadow dropped um 
Metroid Prime remake on Switch, and then PlayStation did nothing. The state of play <laughs> came around, and there was everyone's like, well, "What's the shadow drop going to be? What did they What did they shadow drop on us? The 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 news for the battle pass for Kill the Justice League? Maybe that was the best thing God. that came from." Battle, but if you see nothing ruins my excitement for a game more than seeing the words battle pass. This Kill the Justice League is giving me Avengers vibes, so or or Gotham Knights vibes, which awful, yeah, terrible, terrible <laughs> game. So I'm gonna be passing up on this most likely. Yeah, I I could just go absolutely off on this. I. It just did so many things that baffle me. Like Captain Boomerang uses guns, like multiple guns. King Shark uses guns. Captain Boomerang has these speed force things that let him run around. Like, and it's sad because it looks super fast. Fun. Like the and, mechanics look better than Gotham Knights and Avengers. Like yeah, the actual like the, mechanics. Like, yeah, like as far as like presentation and like the the smoothness of the mechanics it actually looks like it could be great but they just i don't know i uh wrote a message in the discord earlier today that's like it was really brave of them to take what i said like the multiplayer dynamics of something like overwatch the looter mechanics of something like uh like a destiny des yeah and the physics of a mario game like, everyone has the power to just jump like 30 freaking feet into the air exactly <laughs> I, i'm passing um as a, i was excited for it yeah me somewhat too, dude oh my god now i'm passing um it's it's a pass nope not gonna be wasting my money so i want to circle back around to the switch but since we're talking about the state of play let's just finish up our thoughts on that and <laughs> what else sticks out to you because this state of play was uh stinking. uh chia a uh, indie game inspired by like the legend of zelda wind waker i don't know what like specifically what the culture is a game inspired by new caledonian culture uh new caledonian i don't know what that okay so it's like french oh South okay Pacific kind of th yeah i saw a trailer for this a while ago I, I didn't even know about it i found out about it somehow this looks awesome like it it looks like you know like the people that made it actually put what's the word uh effort into it <laughs> you know like you could just feel every ounce of love and passion that they put into this thing i i cannot wait to play it it coming out relatively soon uh on yeah, march, march 9th and i will be buying at full price and that's not something i do very much that was the standout for me for the state of play they they did show a lot of uh, psvr content and they showed a destiny 2 cinematic trailer they even showed a resident evil 4 remake gameplay trailer all of this stuff is you know cookie cutter even at this point for yeah. re4 we don't need to see more they you know they confirmed mercenary mode or whatever so it's nice to see some more they even revealed a new uh i guess three new street fighter 6 characters um zangief lily and cami so that's interesting if you're yeah. in fighting games, but yeah, that game looks bonkers too. Like the graphics, dude, the gameplay, it looks so smooth. I haven't been into Street Fighter since, jeez, I was into Street Fighter Four a little bit, but really since um, Street Fighter Turbo, I might, I might jump into it. We'll see. And then last but not least, goodbye Volcano High, June fifteenth. Yeah, the weirdest. <laughs> one of the weirdest looking games I've ever seen, but I, we were just talking before we started recording how like, I kind of want to like get into video game development and one idea that I've had for a game, which is actually something I heard on a podcast kind of, cause like they're talking about like, how could you combine music and games? And I had this idea, like, what if it was like a regular game, you know, like a story driven game. And then like, there were moments where it was like a rhythm game and then it would play like essentially a music video and that'd be part of the story it'd be like a musical and so imagine my surprise when i watch the trailer for this game and see what looks like basically that so like the art style is a weird thing 
you know, like it's made for the furries, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, anthropomorphic dinosaurs, which I like dinosaurs. I like rock music. I like story based games. I like indie games. So definitely jump into uh, it. Am I going to play this? Hell yeah. I'm probably going to be the only one, but I don't care. Thank <laughs> you for creating this game for me. Yeah, it's not something I'm going to jump into, but it is it is interesting. I love seeing uh, interesting indies, you know. And a lot of times indies are hit or miss because it, it's more, you know, it's more niche. Going back to Switch, the Prime remake, what's your history with Metroid Prime? Uh, I've actually never... I've... I think I rented Metroid Prime or something for Wii when I was younger, but I don't remember how much I played of it. Um, the the only real Metroid experience I have is I got uh, Metroid Zero Mission for the G- G- Game Boy Advance, like about a year ago or mm-hmm. earlier this year, um, and I played it for a while. And like the atmosphere is great, the exploration I actually thought was fun like it was cool to like find a new power and then it's like oh now i can backtrack to this place and open this pathway or you know make my way through here i'm at the moment i'm stuck but i do definitely want to try beating it eventually because like i i tried playing a few metroidvanias like hollow knight and i don't know i just it's hard for me to like get a sense of place in a non-three-dimensional space but yes. playing Metroid Zero Mission actually kind of made me like the genre. So imagine Prime's, you know, like a 3D game, you know, like a 3D shoot, like a 3D first person shooter, probably with Metroidvania elements. I could say I'm kind of a fan of Metroid now. So they kind of yeah. dropped this at a better time. Because Prime is 3D, it does make it more digestible to understand where you're at in the world compared yeah. to 2D. At least, at least that sounds how it's gonna be for yeah like it's like it's like i'm playing like because i never really realized this but technically horror survival games are metroidvanias in the sense that you know like you're finding out like you're finding like you know like a key to unlock this door or finding a switch to like um and like evil i love the recent resident evil games absolutely love them so you know like it's like it's really reward like it's hard for me to actually beat those games because i'm bad at you know that aspect of it but like there are a few greater senses of achievement than finding out how to get through a place and then seeing how like everything works together and it's like oh that was the, the door that was locked that was right by this place i see the appeal of them for sure so i want to you know try my hand at some of the metroids because great series yeah yeah definitely like you could tell that it's one of the few series that Nintendo is willing to throw money at. <laughs> <laughs> True. And um, another great series that they keep throwing money at is Mario Kart. And I've been playing Mario Kart 8 so much. So they mm. had a Nintendo Direct and they Shadow Drop Prime at the end. They also announced Wave 4 of the Mario Kart uh, booster packs. It, it'll be coming out sometime in the spring. It has eight courses a Yoshi's Island inspired course that looks amazing and Birdo a new character coming out Mario Kart I don't think there's ever going to be another Mario Kart they're just going to keep dumping into <laughs> 8 Eight's going to stay alive forever is that be the uh, Grand Theft Auto 5 of Nintendo <laughs> is that a uh, track and Birdo like is that like one uh, package or like is it like two separate uh, no it's one package oh good okay so if you have, I was gonna the, say, I can't imagine just paying just for Birdo. Like that would be, <laughs> yeah. Now you can buy it a la carte. So you can buy the boot, the eight courses plus Birdo for however much they're selling it for, and you get all the courses and Birdo together. Or you can pay for the Nintendo Switch Online plus expansion pack, which mm-hmm. I'm paying for, and I think it was like forty dollars for a year. So it gets you. You know, all of the Nintendo Switch Online access plus the booster courses and all of the DLC for Mario Kart 8 because oh, wow. they're they're going to continue coming out with courses. They've they've had six already, and it sounds like this is going to be seven and eight. Uh, I'm talking about the like the uh, the cups in the game. So they have six 
and there's a total of 12. So this will be seven and eight. And then you're going to have wave five with two more cups and then wave six with the final two cups. Probably, hopefully, sometime this year, five and six will come out. So yeah, anyways, I've been playing that like crazy. And I'll just keep going with what I've been playing. Have you heard of Atomic Heart? Yeah, this... This is certainly one of the most interesting looking games I've seen recently because I hear it's like it has its flaws, but it's still a ton of fun. Uh, so I've been playing it on Game Pass. I Like I mentioned earlier, some games like Hi-Fi Rush have been dropping on Game Pass recently. Atomic Heart just came out a few days ago and I started playing it earlier today. Absolutely in love with this game. Oh, really? I mean, it is. What do you like about it? It is so good. A call with Andy while I was playing Atomic Heart, and I could not shut up about the game. So it feels like, okay, I'll just start with this. The game is an alternate history game where the Soviets had advanced technology in World War II, and I guess the war lasted until 49, and the Soviets won World War II. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if they took over the Earth or whatever. I haven't, I'm not that far in the game, but I just know the Soviets won World War II in 49 because they had advanced technology. So flash forward into the future, robots. Uh, you're in uh, as advanced Soviet Russia. Think uh, Bioshock Infinite. Think Columbia, the floating city, or the city in the clouds from Bioshock Infinite. These Russian cities are just like Columbia. There's like chains of these floating cities in Soviet Russia that are that, that there's this advanced technology, and there's they have robots helping them with everything. So you go through the the intro, intro of the game and whatnot, and then something happens, and these robots start turning on you, like the uh, Will Smith iRobot movie, basically. Mm. Except you're in yeah. alternate history Soviet Russia. And it is like horror-esque. It's not a horror game, but like it is horror-esque, almost like um, a Prime game, like Metroid Prime, in a way. It has that eerie atmosphere to it, or I should say Bioshock. It reminds me literally of a ken levine game like i'm sure the whoever the the lead developer on this was it was actually ken levine in disguise because <laughs> it is it is so much bioshock instead of your your vigors or whatever you have this uh robotic glove that like talks to you and has these tentacles that come out and they act like magnets or something and it, it feels like you have some kind of you know like vigor ability from the bioshock you buy a shock infinite or something but it's it's so much like it but it's just different enough the thing i watched a little bit of a playthrough and the thing that like uh, so there's one thing that i really like about the game but it's like a really small thing and then one thing that kind of put me off like the story seems like a pretty serious sci-fi story you know it's like the terminator it's like i robot but then like the the freaking dialogue feels like it was written by Justin Roiland or something. Like it's very juvenile. Like I love it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I know what you're well, saying. It looks like it. It's it's really charming. Doesn't know what it is, kind of maybe. Yeah, it, it but, does feel lost in its identity, yeah. but it is it is charming. Like it it has the the feel of a Wolfenstein game, but the mm. atmosphere and you know uh, gameplay of a Bioshock game. It's, it's very interesting. I want to play it mainly because I think it looks interesting, at least. And when I get a PS5, I will definitely get it on sale. Because, yeah, for better, or, like, I'm sure at worst it'll just be like a Resident Evil game, you know, just like a fun schlocky, like, exactly. There's a space for things like that too. Like, not everything has to be like, you know, like this absolute like genre redefining masterpiece. Exactly. And it's not, it's just, it's doing what it does well. And I think I'm very up on it right now because I'm playing it on game pass. I didn't, I mean, I spent what, $15 essentially on this game. I didn't spend yeah. 60. So if I would have spent 60 on this game, I just would have been like, man, this isn't $60 quality right here, but it, I'm getting it on game pass. So I'm up on it. Isn't it a little weird when a new game launches on like game pass or playstation plus like that to me seems like i don't know like they didn't confidence 
So they're like, oh, let's make a way for people to play it without having to buy it at full price. I'll tell you exactly know. what it feels like. No, I'll tell you what it feels like. It feels like when you're walking through like a Walmart and you walk by the $5 bin and it has all of the the movies or games or whatever in a pile in this big bin. And you just reach in and you you find some random game for super cheap. And you're like, okay, well, this looks interesting and it's only $5. That's what these that's what services feel like you know what i mean you're like yeah. oh i mean i only spent five ten dollars on this so and i got all of this stuff here let me just try it and it feels kind of cheap no matter what service you're talking about like you can argue game pass is the best value or playstation plus is the best value but games that were released day and date or released within the launch window so i'd say within the first three months two, three months of the game coming out. It just feels cheap when it goes straight to a service. But then again, on the other hand, I paid $70 for Gotham Knights. So who's the loser? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I guess it's just all about what you like to play and if you're having fun playing it. I mean, who cares if it's on a a service or not? The game is going to be whatever it's worth to you. It's just going to be subjective. Like Gotham Knights, I wouldn't touch that thing with a... a, a, (laughs) a 30 foot pole not knowing now what i know but a game like atomic heart i would have probably been happy spending 70 dollars on it you know once i see it through so all right that's my thoughts on on that so um what have you been playing and then we'll move into uh oh impression i'm still playing this stuff i talked about on last episode which is uh the original dead space on ps3 i got farther i'm at a place now where i I upgraded my suit, so now I have to uh, find some uh, power cores or nodes, whatever they're called, and upgrade my weapons. I upgraded a little bit of the skill tree. Um, it's a great game. I mean, like the horror atmosphere, you know, like the story. Honestly, I checked out of the story like after about twenty minutes because it, it, it's just really basic, bare bones. But you're not playing this for the story. You're playing this to shoot the limbs off of a weird alien creature that used to be a human. So, I mean, what more can you ask for? I'm at a point in Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga where I have to grind a little bit or something. I I got creamed by this boss like three times. So that's fun. And then I got some other indie games on the backlog. Of course, got to have the yeah. indie games there. All right, so we're going to get into... You know, we've been talking about the production and value of gaming. So we're going to talk about video games being works of art and what that means. So as a as a transition into this, I actually want to give my thoughts and impressions on the Last of Us series and the idea of transmedia art, and that can lead us into our topic. So the Last of Us series on HBO, right? It is a form of transmedia art, of course. It started as a video game. Then there were uh, comics. What is it called? Yeah, A Last of Us American Dream. Point is, Last of Us was a game. You know, they had their DLC. They had the comic series. They had the sequel. Now there's this the uh, HBO series. What that is, it's a form of transmedia art. We have all kinds of examples of that. You know, the Sonic movies just came out. We got the Super Mario movie coming out. We had uh, Uncharted last year came out. You know, there's all these examples. Oh, this is a video game movie. This is a, a video game series. All of this. And I think The Last of Us on HBO is one of the best examples of, you know, video games moving to live action or an example of transmedia art. Yeah, for sure. So far, we're, we, we're on episode six. And when, when the series is finished, we're going to have probably multiple episodes about it because there's so much to talk about. But the series is is absolutely amazing. Episode 6 was my favorite by far and you know it doesn't follow the game exactly. And that's okay because this is it's a form of art where they're taking their own interpretation of the game while still being faithful to it. To me, that is a form of art and we're we're going to get into the topic and kind of debate what that even means, but before we get into the topic, tell me just a quick, you know, your thoughts on the, the Last of Us HBO series. Oh my god, dude. I like it's just consistently justifying its existence. Like I've seen like 
mm-hmm. people criticize certain things how like oh there isn't a lot of action uh joel in the show seems he doesn't seem as much of a badass as joel in the games ellie in the shows you know not as like you know gentle and kind as she is in the games and it's like i like these people don't seem to understand that you can't have the exact same experience in a sh- as a sh- as in this you, you have in yeah. games in the shows because in a game there's way more dialogue and you flesh out the characters in different ways whereas a show it's literally just scenes and that's it so I I don't really have any pro- like I don't I mean I can't say I don't have any issues I guess but like at the end of the day like they haven't done anything yet that like I felt went against the spirit of the games like and I'm going to be honest I think I like this show more than the first game so far and I connect to this Joel way more than I did Joel in the first game. I mean it's it's a 10 out of 10. The game is amazing. When I'm done with the show, I do plan on replaying them both. So I think because I'm in a different place, like mentally, emotionally and stuff than I was even in 2020 when I played the first one. So I I have a feeling that my thoughts on it are going to be at least a little different. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. Yeah, I'm going to do this same thing. I actually started playing The Last of Us Part 1 on PS5. I haven't played the game in years because I know the game like the back of my hand. I mean, I could, I can recall any moment in that game, you know, if I needed to. I just know the game. So when the show's finished, I'm going to go ahead and watch the show all the way through again, write down my notes, and I'm going to play Part 1 all the way through. Like I said, we have never seen a, a project like this be this successful like it is you know what i mean think of the halo show you know that that didn't leave this kind of didn't leave this kind of impact that the last of us is i've i'm i'm seeing people on pod like popular podcasts right now bring up the last of Us show on hbo because of the waves it's creating it is it's just incredible what it's doing so let's just get into obviously it's a work of art the show is a work of art some people debate whether or not video games are works of art or if there's something else. I know you have a lot of thoughts on this, so why don't you walk me through what you what you've been thinking and what you've been reading? I'll just, you know, I'll have my questions and and my thoughts on it, but go ahead and you can take it from here. I think I'm not sure exactly how I got the idea for this episode, but um it was spurred um now I I feel like I need to uh add a little bit of a disclaimer before I jump into this. I recognize that Roger Ebert is a legend. He was like maybe the most influential film critic. How many, you know, like YouTube movie critics were probably inspired by Roger Ebert, you know, Chris Stuckman, nostalgia critic. I'm sure there are plenty more. He was a legend. He was a really smart guy. He loved movies way more than a lot of people love their own families. I'd bet. Um, so I'm not going to sit here, nor is Caleb going to sit here and act like we're smarter than Roger Ebert or anything like that. He just happened to say something that we have some thoughts about, you know, that's it. So I just wanted to say that because I don't want to seem like one of those people that, you know, is like high and mighty about stuff that older people have said. He gave a quote one time. He said, I am prepared to believe that video games can be elegant, subtle, sophisticated, challenging, and visually wonderful, but I believe the nature of the medium prevents it from moving beyond craftsmanship to the stature of art. To my knowledge, no one in or out of the field has ever been able to cite a game worthy of comparison with the great dramatists, poets, filmmakers, novelists, and composers. That a game can aspire to artistic importance as a visual experience, I accept. But for most gamers, video games represent a loss of those precious hours we have available to make ourselves more cultured, civilized, and empathetic. And like, you know, a few people have responded to this. I saw two TED Talks of people talking about it. And then he gave a follow-up where he basically put his foot in the sand and doubled down about his opinions you know which i 
think it's admirable and people stick to their opinions, you know, if they don't feel any reason to change them, you know, that's fine. Yeah, I think this is like an example of like how the older generation, like they were presented with things in a certain way. Like he grew up, film was more, I guess, artistically ambitious in some ways than it is now. Like it had a certain like weight to it that now it kind of doesn't. I mean, even back then there were like schlocky blockbuster movies, but like, you know, you look at stuff like Casablanca, Citizen Kane psycho other alfred hitchcock movies you know uh 12 angry men like you know like he grew up at that time you know video games were mainly like that popular like from the beginning of time uh you had in king tut's tomb actually there was a game called senate which was like you know like your typical like backgammon checker kind of thing it was buried in king tut's tomb and then uh Back in Victorian times in the UK and the United States, upper class people in their recreational time played um, things, what they call parlor games, you know, like some board games and then some stuff like charades or like sports, a lot of really weird stuff. In 1958, an American physicist named William Higginbottom uh, created a game called Tennis for Two which was like Pong before Pong was Pong. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was that kind of thing. And he did it using lights. And then, you know, like the 80s with arcade machines and stuff. So in Roger Ebert's time, video games weren't, you know, like he probably grew up, like obviously he was around when they were getting popular, but like that wasn't something that probably wasn't really a part of his childhood, you know? And then like, I don't know how you could look at like the evolution of games. What I mentioned, like Senate, and then tennis for two, and then like like you know like chess checkers, which weren't you know just regular games. And then you jump like the advent of technology. You have the Atari, you have Pong, you know, you have Pac Man, all that stuff. And then arcade machines in the eighties, which you know was basically like put in some coins, try to get a high score, and essentially that was it. You know that was a fun thing children did, but you wouldn't call any of these art right even like when platformers came around like S super mario brothers one on the nes you know that's a fun game that's basically like the console version of an arcade machine but it's not exactly art like there's nothing to it you know you have to rescue peach but the only story you get is when you beat one of bowser's castles toad or whoever says oh sorry princess peach isn't here right now would you like to leave a message and then it's like oh well i gotta go somewhere else but then something crazy happens right um in the 80s let me find the exact year 1986 a little game called dragon quest rpgs before this were basically like just purely text you know like you walk in a room what do you do i open the door i look to the left i look to the right the dragon quest comes along and it gives you an open world it gives you a story it gives you oh i'm walking around i'm fighting monsters i have a goal boom 1987 a little game in a small series you might have heard of final fantasy Final Fantasy. Now, this game has a story, like all the way through. Like up until then, video games stories was relegated to like the instruction booklet had a brief, you know, synopsis. You know, maybe like in like I know in the the old Castlevania games, there was like a brief thing at the start. You know, it's like you have to fight the dark wizard, or you know fight dracula or evil has risen from the land you are a brave warrior can bring peace to the land once again but like final fantasy comes along these get like the, this was revolutionary for games you know because you're walking around an overworld like dragon quest like a story you know like there's a villain and then you fight the villain and then you find out that he's been creating a time loop and then it's like, I'm sure people were like, what? And then, you know, like Final Fantasy games set the standard, in my opinion, that a lot of games built upon. It perfected. Video games were never the same in terms of like storytelling, in terms of graphics, in terms of music. You know, they're always evolving. You know, they're always evolving through the years. To look at a medium that's constantly evolving in so many areas 
And, you know, just like film, just like TV, just like books, all that stuff and say, all, all of these things are art, but this thing over here, it's not art. You know, it's easy to see going back how you would not consider a game like Pong art, even though I would disagree. I think it's art, but it's, it's understandable, especially if, if you're coming from, you know, the film world where it's all about story. You know, there's obviously techniques to it and whatnot, but it's all about characters, presentation, story, plot. It's it's a, it's it's not just technical, but it there's some there's art that goes into it. You know what I mean? Um, and you could argue, you know, pong that's technical, but there's no story and whatnot. And then you get up to the arcade games, and you keep evolving until you get to the Nintendo, and you get your mascots. You get Mario and Donkey Kong. Then you have the opportunity to have characters even though they're just platforming you have a character that then you can make you know head canon about or you can develop a story around eventually but you still have music in this time like you, games have composers and you know you were talking and it just it brought to my mind composers like grant kirkhope or peter mcconnell or gustavo for the last of us lobo uimatsu he does the majority of the Final Fantasy games. Yes. Absolute, he's essentially the John Williams of video games. That alone makes it art. Now, if you want to say, oh, well, the music is is what makes it art. I would you disagree know, because yeah. video game music works in its full effect when you're playing the game. If you just listen to the music by itself, yeah, you know, you'll probably like it, but if you don't know what like scenes it's playing over or what part of the story it pops up in. So then you're talking about when you, you get in, you get further down the road and you start getting into more in-depth games like a dragon quest or final fantasy. Then you have, you know, a giant story. You have plot, you have these characters, there's stakes, there's meanings, there's choices and emotion now in gaming. So then that evolves into, from the 2D plane in the 90s, you get into the 3D plane. You know, there are, I think it's I think it's harder to make a good 2D game than it is to make a 3D game. Oh, yeah. I just want to jump in real quick with Final Fantasy. Um, F F Final Fantasy VI was actually released on the S Super Nintendo, regarded by quite a few fans yeah. as the best in the series. You know, because of like story, music, obviously characters. That's a 2D game, dude. That's a pixel art game, but they made it in such a way where you play the game and you're following these pixel characters who have no f f facial animation. Yeah. Have no, there's no voice acting at that time. There were no voices. It was just text. And yet, because of the way it was created, it resonated with so many people. Now, explain that if that's not art. And if that's no. just, oh, it's just the thing people made. It doesn't mean, you know, like it's not up there with the highest movies. It doesn't but have. Why do people um, talk so much about that one? Like that doesn't have some kind of feeling or emotion in you. And what I want to get into really is I, I would definitely say that 2D games are, you know, they're art. And then especially when you get in to the, the late 80s, early 90s with these, you know, RPGs or really, or, or these, any kind of side scrollers or whatever you want to say that have a story to it. You're right. They don't have the facial animations, really. They don't have, you know, X, Y, or Z. They're still art. But then you get into the, the evolution of 3D. And what that brings isn't just another, you know, dimension to it. Literally, what it allows is the invention of mocap the invention yeah. of um voice acting all of this that creates jobs for artists uh in the industry you have vo artist you have mocap artist you have 3d environmental artist you know what i mean you have the sound effects artist you know what i mean it's it is multiple it's multiple aspects types of art forms culminating into a project into a video game which is like an ultimate work of art. Imagine Actually, The Last um, of Us without the comp the uh, score or the the music composition. It would not hit as hard. Imagine it without the state of you know state of the art mocap that it had. Imagine without uh, a voice 
voiceover talent like Troy Baker or Ashley Johnson. Those are all, all of those aspects working together, all of those different um, forms of art working together creates, uh, you know, a video game. And I'm just using that as an example. But when you get further down the line into more modern gaming, it's it's just art. I mean, it's more art forms working together to create a product. It's funny you bring that up. Uh, that's a pretty good transition into uh, I I watched uh, one of the GDC talks with a woman named Abby Sherlock, uh, who is she's a video games creator. She's a producer and she's been a host of um, a few things on Twitch. Uh, she's been broadcast on the live page of Twitch as a personality multiple times, led panels with performers from the Final Fantasy series, and mentored children through Girls Make Games. Uh, and she's also spoken at developer conferences. She's been a host for esports stuff. So, you know, she's someone in the industry. And uh, she did this talk about the dramaturgy in games. Now, if you don't know what dramaturgy is, it's basically the theory and practice of dramatic composition, which is basically like somebody like working with video game developers to like help them flesh out their story and stuff, like the stuff, you know, like the aspects of lore and all that. And uh, she compared video games to being in theater, which is something I never thought about it before, but uh, she says, Empathy in games and theater are the only mediums that require active participation. The performers are the players. And like what the analogy that she used is like if you're somebody performing in a play, if you like tell a joke or something and you see how the audience reacts, you can like improvise something or like switch it up to get like, you know, like a certain kind of reaction. Yeah. You know, like you, you can lead the audience on. Well, when you're playing a game, there are multiple ways to play a game. You know, like if you're playing like a stealth game, you can be stealthy like they want you to, or you could you can just go all balls to the wall, you know, and just make it an action game. She brought up the game, uh, The Legend of Zelda: Skyward Sword, and how when you're playing as Link, because of the motion controls, you're using the Wii Mote as a sword. So, like in a way, it makes you Link because you're using a sword too. Um, let me just jump in because that is exactly what I was thinking when it comes to um, games that give the player agency, which I mean, every game gives you agency or else yeah. you know, it wouldn't be a video game, but some more than others. So a game like, let's just say Skyward Sword, where you can control the sword, you and I will never have the same playthrough. Yeah. Even, even if we go through the same missions the same way, the way that we, you know, approach it is completely unique to us, um, which is completely different than anything you will ever experience with a movie because it means you could sit down and watch a movie. We both saw the same exact thing. If, like, our playthroughs of Last of Us or something are, would it probably be fairly different games, you know, because a large part of the mechanic is you doing stuff. Yeah, and then I think of games like uh, sandboxes, like Minecraft or like GTA. Think of a, a big game that you you live your own life in those games. You create the game almost. They obviously give you the they give you the tools, and they say here you take it and you make your own art with this. You know, it's 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 an experience that you can't have. You literally cannot have with other forms of of media imagine you're playing the last of us and you pick up the controller imagine if you never touch the analog sticks you're not you're gonna from the opening moment of the game you are never gonna see more than that moment because if you're not participating if you're not being active in this it means nothing so it, you, it's not like pressing play on a movie or play on um, a music or sitting down at a theater to watch a play it is gonna play and you're going to watch it but with a game if you don't if you're not active in it if you're not um contributing to the art form you're you're not going to experience it yeah exactly like especially too with like my favorite genre of games or narrative ones where like you make you know choices like you know telltale quantic dream uh certain visual novels have that too and dude i could tell you that like you know like playing like a linear game 
you know, like where there's freedom and how you play it, but not in story. It's one thing, you know, those games could still be effective, but like, it's essentially like when I play, you know, the like narrative choice based games that like, I kind of like, they bring out like what's in my subconscious and like, I end up writing a story for myself that, you know, just like really speaks to me in that moment. So like how, like everyone's playthroughs of those is obviously going to be, you know, at least somewhat different. And like, it's basically like you're, it's basically like the developers are like, okay, what kind of story do you want to tell? You know, think of somebody like Hideo Kojima. You can't say that he is not making art. He Imagine actually a- wanted to be a filmmaker originally. It- Yes, exactly. <laughs> and he may still transition into making, um, you know, films or or something like that, something live action like Neil Druckmann. So Neil Druckmann, he, you know, he went from The Last of Us game to working on The Last of Us series. And, you know, is, is one art and one one not art? Yeah. So like, so like, okay, like using him as like a devil's advocate. So if video games are not art that's up to the standards of like film tv that means th- this man worked with people at naughty dog for years to create two games and then now he's working on the show adaptation which is an art form adapting something he made that's not an art form it yeah. just doesn't make any sense it, it, it exa- exactly <laughs> it it, it contradicts itself. If there's a Hideo Kojima game, like imagine when uh, Death Stranding 2 comes out. That is so popular because he creates art. You know, it's not it's not Pong. That's what I'm getting at. It's not Pong. Yeah. It's not, this isn't, this isn't Pac-Man. Like we love those games. They're, they are art, but the medium keeps evolving. The art form keeps evolving, just like other forms of art. Think about, you know, go back to Citizen Kane right? We don't have movies like that anymore. You know, we can, we can obviously take this to the complete other end of the spectrum, talk about, you know, modern movies versus, you know, if there are whatever versus older movies, but either way, mediums, think about music, they change over time, they progress over time, they evolve. And that is, it's the same way with video games. And then this, this, it gets, there's another level, there's another layer to it, even to where it has created a whole industry of Dreamers and content creators, people that record themselves playing in their reactions and put it online basically for you to watch as a movie. Like you could watch, instead of playing The Last of Us, you can watch a thousand different people do a playthrough of The Last of Us, giving their own interpretations and reactions. And each one of those playthroughs are going to be specific to those um, players, but you get to watch them. It So... It can, you can turn it into a movie almost. Think about video game um, soundtracks and scores. How many times have you just, without playing the game, you know, typed in Final Fantasy soundtrack and just listened to the music? A lot, you know, dude. <laughs> exactly. Same thing with, um, you know, the great Nintendo tracks and, uh, you know, Grant Kirkhope's music. I mean, video games, are they're a culmination of so many different art forms but it, it it there's another layer to where it creates you know it creates movies it cre- they, it creates content and it'll create songs and music it creates jobs there's the business side of it where it creates opportunities for artists well speaking of that i wanted to circle back to abby sherlock cuz in her uh, talk <clears throat> she she uh, showed this chart which uh it essentially took like jobs in like you know, the, like, film, movie, uh, I mean, the film and TV industries, and then compared them with ones in the video game industry. First, I'm going to read off ones that are, in the video game industry, they have a different name, but they're essentially the same thing. So a stage performer is either motion capture actor or voice actor. Uh, It's... I'm sorry. It's like speaking of theater and video games because she's comparing them. Sorry. Very uh, similar. Yeah. Player, audience, costumes, character artist, set, environment artist, props, system designer, 
casting, HR, stage manager, operations, and then ones that are literally the same, lighting artist, director. Video games do have a director, if you can believe it. They yes. do. Uh, sound and producer. All of these, like, dude, like, see, watch, like, the behind the scenes of any game. They don't just slap these things together. They work on these things like they're making a movie. And, oh, and as hard as it is to make a movie and a show, it's even harder, I would argue, yes. to make a game. Because Way once harder. you do all that, you have to test it. And if there's even one bug, one thing that's slightly off, you have to modify it. So there's also an element of programming. Well, and there's web the programming that exactly. isn't in movies or shows. Like, let's take, for example, the, the military. They'll put you in a VR set to put you in a scenario or to, to put you in a, in a type of equipment in VR to let, have you learn it. And you don't have to go out and risk, um, you know, resources, risk your life, risk, you know, this or that. You know, think of the drone, think of drones, you know what I mean? Think of all of these advancements. It's coming from the advancements in video game technology and, yeah, and what's happening in that industry. And too, with like things like Wario paint, you know, like other paint things, you're literally using one form of art, which is a yeah. game to create a more traditional form of art. And people nowadays that are like architects or like designers or something, and they like use like a program to create like a 3d representation yeah. of something that they're going to build in real life. How is that much different from like Minecraft or Dragon Quest Builders or something like that? It's really not that different. You're visualizing something and you're using a tool in a digital space to create that thing. And then you can take that and create it in real life. Or if you're playing a game, just admire that creation. Like how I was getting into earlier with Atomic Heart, uh, I'm just completely admiring what they're doing with it in terms of the design you know it's an all it's it's a story but they're taking it and they're giving it a not yeah. only they're giving it life by giving it visuals but it's not just a movie they're giving it life by allowing you to have agency in how that that story unfolds and how how you progress in that story you're not reading word after word you're not watching frame after frame essentially you are you're controlling you know, you, instead of going down this hallway, you can go down this hallway. And it is, you know, it's like you said, it's a culmination of all of those art forms in this new, in this new medium that is an, is an art form. I, I don't see how you can uh, deny, you deny that. Perfect example. And I'm going to, I'm going to end what I have to say with this. And we've been talking a lot about The Last of Us and this happened in the series. In episode six, what was the best scene of that episode? When... Joel and Ellie were in the room talking. Ellie was sitting there reading a book and Joel comes in to tell her that he is leaving her because she's better off without him. Yeah. You know that scene? Yeah. That is that is one of the most emotional scenes in in the whole in the whole HBO series. It's one of the most impactful. It is I mean, it was a masterpiece. That scene was amazing. That scene was taken directly from the game, word for word, yeah. beat for beat. Even and they uh, even talk about it. Even Craig, yeah, uh, yeah, Craig Mazin, the showrunner, said like there were a lot of places where they you know like d d deviated from the game because of course that's what yeah. they wanted to do in some places. But that was like one of the things that he was like, no, I don't really want to change this because. I just love it so much. A guy who yeah. previously did the Chernobyl series, which I haven't seen, but I'm going to watch it because I hear Apparently it's fantastic. It's he was so struck by a scene in a, in in a, a video game that he played that he wanted to preserve its integrity. How because is that not is an artistic part. scene? End of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I know this is a type of topic where we completely agree with each other and we're just um, talking about talking about it. And yeah, I mean, like, it's like one thing to just not be into games or ever exactly. play games, but that's fine. It, it just grinds my like. No, the the reality is that a lot of gamers are people who just like people who enjoy you know watching like an entire show on a weekend or whatever. They have their own stuff that they got going on. They're, They're well adjusted it, people. They just they just you know get really fulfilled by this medium. Yeah, they're very attached to this art. And the medium is full of artists. I mean, to look over it, I mean, I, I'm always supporting the devs. 
you know, I'm not, I'm not on the side of the critics. I'm usually not on the side of the fans. I'm usually always on the sides of the developers because those are the artists and the people working give us, you know, the games we enjoy. They're, they're the artists. To say that, you know, the, the games industry and, and the medium of video games is not as impactful or it's not as valuable as another form of art like um, movie theater or music, etc. It's it's taking these actual yeah. artists and we ran through, you know, all of the artists and, you know, you had that comparison chart. You know, the, these people are extremely valuable and we see what happens when they transition now from video games into movies and series, how amazing that turns out. I think, man, I think we went over some some great ideas and ideologies in there. This episode was like Half-Life 3 and that <laughs> it's been in development for so long that we didn't even know if it was real. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't turn out like Dead Island 2. Oh. <laughs> That's that's hilarious. All right, so that's great. Yeah, they're definitely they're definitely works of art. You know, I think we left it all on the table. So yeah. All right, and with that, um, episode eleven, man. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm not sure the next one after this if it's going to be more game related or movie related or whatnot. Either way, we're probably going to be discussing works of art.